My name is Haley Madison. Today is Thursday, November 12th, 2015, and I am at the home of Karen Ashton in Orem, Utah, interviewing her for the purposes of the Utah Women's Walk. We will be talking about Karen's life and her contributions to life in the state of Utah. Thank you for having us. I am thrilled to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Let's start with your background information, where you were born and you grew up and went to school. Well, I am the oldest of five children. My father's name is Carl E. Jacklin, and my mother's name was Edna Christie Hansen. And I think being the oldest of five is a, is a push towards independence always. Um, I, was, I lived for the very early part of my life up in the Cottonwood area in Salt Lake, and then moved to Murray as I was in my elementary school grade. And I think that living in the Cottonwood area was food for the imagination because it was so beautiful, always, and I think it probably was an important part of my life. And so you have four younger siblings. I have four younger siblings. Mm -hmm. Boys, girls. I have two sisters and two brothers, and so, and I was 12 when my youngest sister was born. So just old enough to be a really good babysitter. <laughs> Do you have any important memories from your childhood? Well, um, as I said, growing up in the area of uh, the Cottonwood area in Salt Lake was so beautiful. And I think nature played a huge part in my early years. And there was such, as they say, a scope for imagination there. Um, at probably about the age of almost eight, we moved to Murray which was at that point a gathering place for so many young men who had served in World War II and their families. So these families came from all, all over with so many backgrounds. We had people from Greece. We had people with all, all kinds of backgrounds. And that was huge for me because I got to appreciate the fact that not everybody is the same or comes from a cookie cutter background. So I actually think that was very important to me in my growing up years. Is there an experience from growing up that you think prepared you for what you've done later in your life besides meeting people from different backgrounds? Give me a second to think about that <laughs> for just a minute. Um, do you know, I would honestly have to say that I do not believe there's ever one single event that, that it is the collection of events that makes a life so rich. And certainly the opportunity to see the varied backgrounds from all of the, the young people that I played with and that lived on my street made a huge difference to me. And the fact that I wasn't always the center of attention there. In fact, if anything, um, I wasn't the center of attention and I longed to have good friendships and, and be with people in a meaningful way. I do remember one time that um, somebody had said they, they didn't want to be my friend. And I remember thinking, well, that's a big mistake because I'm a great friend and having me would be a great resource in your life. I do remember thinking that that's probably a silly girly thing, but, but I still believe I'm a good friend. You should have me as a friend. <laughs> were there women that you admired when you were growing up? Um, I think I come from a background. My mother was a very strong individual. And I have thought about that so many times. In many people's lives, their mother is the primary source of, of information about mothering and womanhood for them. Um, I was always on the look for other women that I could emulate and be like. Um, Mom and I had an interesting uh, relationship because she was so strong and because I am too. I think we were kind of battling for the turf uh, sometimes, although I love her dearly and she was, for me, a saint, and I'm grateful. But I was looking for other women constantly, and I was finding them. 
And they weren't the women that the world would have looked to. They weren't especially beautiful physically, but they had a strong impact in their own area and sphere. How did you meet your husband? Um, I was attending Brigham Young University and he was attending the University of Utah. It's very unlikely for two people to come together with those backgrounds, but um, and he lived in a very prominent family on the east side of the state, and I lived almost on the wrong side of the tracks, not quite, but very close. And so the chances of our ever coming together are pretty slim, but we met on a blind date. We had some of our, uh, I had a friend, and she was dating his brother, and they set us up. And I think I knew from the very beginning that I had met my match. Um, he's a brilliant man. And after 47 years, almost 48, I can say quite truthfully that I am never bored of being with him, that I still find him intellectually stimulating and spiritually stimulating in every way. What were your early married years like? We were a, a financially struggling family. Um, I remember that it was more difficult for him than for me. When he would finish making out the checks every month, he would just be in despair because we would be so low in our bank account. And for me, it was such a change because in my family, we were always borrowing from Peter to pay Paul in, in my lifestyle when I was growing up. So I finally had to take over the finances for the family to save him from that kind of agony. And I felt great if we had $8 left at the end of the month, if we had paid all of our obligations. I felt like we were in great shape. So you, you have 11 children? I do have 11 children. Oh, how has being a mother influenced your life? Well, everything I've done, I think, ultimately is for them. People ask me all the time, why did you do this? Why did you do that? Um, I think it has everything to do with them. I loved my babies. I loved the experience of being a mother. It was not the thing to say that you wanted to do. When I was a young person, the world was full of, and I think in some ways it still is, what are your career moves for women? And to openly say that you, your desire, the desire of your heart was to mother in a remarkable fashion was not considered the appropriate thing. And I loved being a mother. And I found in that the most creative avenues that I believe exist, it was the hardest work. I have ever done. And I've done some remarkable things, but I do not know another thing physically, as physically exhausting, as emotionally exhausting, as spiritually exhausting, as being the mother of 11 children. What were the hardest parts about not only being a mother, but with so many children, such a large family? Well, quite honestly, uh, we were living on a limited income. We loved what my husband was doing. He was a professor, but that doesn't pay a lot of money. And um, we were on, we were expecting our eighth child when I thought, I don't know how we are going to manage to take care of all of them. And it was a constant pleading thought to the heavens to help us realize some new source of income and we were blessed to be able to have that happen to us, a, a wonderful business decision on the part of my husband that allowed us to be able to take care of not eight, not nine, not 10, but 11 children and now 59 grandchildren. What have been the blessings and the good parts about having a large family? It's so full of diversity. Um, I have 11 children, and as every mother will tell you, 
no child is anything like any other child. And so as they come into your family and you watch them blossom, it is a remarkable experience to see a life unfolding in front of you with all of its possibilities and all of its limitations and with what mortality does. Um, it's, it, it's, it's, I, I, I'm searching for the word and I can't find it because it's too big. It's too big a word to describe what you get to see when you have that many people in a family. And it's total and absolute chaos sometimes. <laughs> so I have heard that you take your family on a trip every year. What have been the highlights or the best memories from that? Well, early on, we would have to go in a very conservative way wherever we were going. Maybe it was camping up to Payson Lakes in Utah and getting muddy and dirty from being in the but we were, you know, in the water, but we were together. And that was the most important part. And we shared that memory. And now, years ago, I looked at all of the films of Christmas and decided that all of that stuff was gone. But the memory was the most important thing. So we decided to stop giving Christmas gifts and to start giving this trip every year to our children and their children. And we have had remarkable experiences all over the world. Our youngest children were blessed to see London and Switzerland and Canada and some of them the Far East. It, it's, um, it's been a remarkable opportunity. But we did the same thing when we didn't have very many resources. We took them with us. What has been your favorite trip that you've been on? Do uh, you know that I, I'm always looking for favorites or absolutes in some way or another. I can't say that because every we're in a different stage of development and every trip is a different experience for us. So they're all amazingly fun. What do you have planned for this year? Um, we just finished a trip to Cape Cod with just our, our older children, I am planning a trip to go back to Massachusetts. I don't know exactly how many will go with me and, or exactly when I will go, but I have found that my family roots are back there for hundreds of years, and I want to go back to Upper State Massachusetts, and I want to go into Maine, and I want to go to Acadia National Park and have a great time. So that's what I'm planning. Do you have a particular person that you feel has influenced or mentored you? No, like I said, I'm so open to um, looking at other people and I'm taking little pieces of everyone's life and saying, I like this, I like that. Um, of course, my very deep spiritual roots are the most important things to me. Everything has to do with my relationship with God. And so all other things are, are extraneous to that. With your husband, you made plans to build a destination for families in Utah at Thanksgiving Point. What has been the process of seeing that dream become a reality? Um, it's been very exciting. It's very creative. Uh, we're, we're thrilled about what's happened and we would like more and more people to come and um, when we began my thoughts were to give thanks to God and to the amazing people in this community who made it possible for us to do so well and be able to take care of our family and I wanted to provide for them some of the fun that they had provided for me and my family. So um, that's the genesis for Thanksgiving Point. It began with a difficult period in my life when after one of the birth of my last child, I experienced what is called a postpartum depression, not to the degree where I couldn't function or take care of my family, 
but to the degree that I was truly suffering in my heart and my soul. And I came to understand the connection I have with nature. And I wanted other people to have a place to go when they hurt and find solace there and peace. And in this busy place, a garden seemed to be a very good idea. I know that's been, that's where your heart is, obviously. Do you have, you don't have favorites, but do you have like a favorite area in the garden? Nope, it depends on what I, what's going on in my life at the moment. Um, I love the secret garden because it's just buried in the heart in the middle of everything and you have to go out of your way to find it. Of course, I love the new Light of the World gardens. They're so expressive of my deep testimony of the Savior Jesus Christ, so I love that. But just acres of grass and trees for many young children in the state of Utah, they never see anything like that. So for me, it's a chance to to think big and and fill my lungs with wonderful air and just look at the beauties of the earth. So you have built the storytelling festival from an idea, and now it's one of the largest in the United States. What were the early days of the festival like? The reason for the festival was to gain support for building a children's library in the city of Orem. We did not have an area, well, the children had been relegated to the basement. There were no heating ducts in the basement. There were no emergency exits in the basement. And worst of all, there was no bathroom in the basement. So the children were down there for a story time. And if anybody had to use the bathroom, we had to essentially stop the story time and go upstairs to take care of that and then have them come back down. So we were in need of a children's library and they told us, the city did, if we could raise $500,000, we could begin the process of getting the children's library. And then a couple of years down the road, they would be able to fund the rest with monies that were currently going to the um, rec center. So our mission was to get the beginning monies so we were coming up with bake sales and home tours and all the things that you think about. And then I was on a plane trip back to Washington, D.C. and read an article about a storytelling festival in Jonesboro, Tennessee. And I thought, that's the perfect answer. It would raise the level of awareness in the community. It would hopefully raise some funds and it would be something that we could use as a PR piece to help people understand the need in the city. And we began and we raised the funds and at the end, we had this amazing storytelling festival, which is probably the second largest in the country and probably the best run in the country. I say that thinking, oh my goodness, but it's the women it's the women we have on our board that have made the difference in how well that that uh, storytelling festival functions. So as you've mentioned, the gospel of Jesus Christ has played such a big role in your life, and you've served in a lot of callings in the LDS Church. How have those callings been, so like your time on the Young Women's General Board? I feel like the Lord has been just moving me along and teaching me new things and preparing me in every situation for that which is lies in front of me. My time on the Young Women's General Board was significant because I love, as I have said, the unfolding of a personality. And I love watching young women um, reach up and reach out from where they are to develop their own feelings and talents and abilities. I love mentoring them and helping them not fall into some of the traps which are available for them. And I felt that the Young Women's Organization was 
so helpful to them to kind of lead them carefully along and help them not make terrible mistakes. What have you learned from your service in the church? Um, well, I think I, I, I learned as a very young person that God is real and that he's there for me. And I think if anything has happened to me in my time, it's that I understand that better and that it's more fir firmly rooted in my heart that I know that he's there and I know that he's, that he's helping us every day. I, I live in a river of light. I have all of my life because of the influence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's everything to me. Many years ago, I tried to find a place inside myself where it had not penetrated. And I realized that it was in every thought. And that when I had a, a thought, it was filtered through what I had come to understand and know. And that when I had a desire, it was filtered through that which I knew was, was true. And that every hope, every wish that I had came from that understanding. Um, I am so grateful to be alive. I had a little brush with death a few years ago and um, some cancer. And every single day, I am grateful to be alive. And I'm grateful to live in a place where no one bombed my house during the evening, or where I'm not running from oppression. And I hope that my life can be of help to someone else um, every day. I pray for that, that my life might be productive enough and helpful enough to make a difference in someone else's life. What were your greatest trials and triumphs while you were serving in the Canada Toronto mission with your husband as president? I tried to figure out where in that service I had some sacrifice. Because in everything that I tried to do, I felt so immediately rewarded that I didn't feel like that there was much sacrifice. And I wanted to make some sacrifice. I have many friends who went so far away that their, that their service was difficult for them. Um, as we were ready to finish our service, they called from Salt Lake and said that the couple who were supposed to come and replace us were not going to be able to come. And would we be able to stay until they could find someone? Well, we had planned after three years to have this wonderful vacation with our family and to see again all of our children, which is very nourishing for me. And now I realize that we were not going to be able to have that happen. And for the first time, I actually felt like I may be able to make a small sacrifice. So when my husband and I talked about it after we hung up the phone, I said, at last, I'll be able to make some kind of sacrifice. And But it was still such a small sacrifice for such an amazing blessing. I have now 537 additional sons and daughters from that remarkable experience. They are our missionaries and will be forever. So you are currently serving as the matron of the Provo Temple. I am. I know I don't know what that entails, and I would assume that maybe not a lot of people know what that calling entails. Um... I wondered years ago what Anna was doing in the temple when Mary and Joseph brought the Savior into the temple the first time. 
I don't, I still don't know what Anna was doing, but I honor her from the standpoint of what I see the women doing in the temple today. My responsibility is to, is to love and care for all of the women who serve in the walls of the temple and to make sure that is all that is done there in the way of ordinances is according to the ways that the Lord would have it done. It is such a sacred and beautiful responsibility that I do not have the language to approach talking about it in a normal situation. I live in the land of loaves and fishes. Every day, there's more than we can do. Every day, there's a bigger need than we can fill. And every day, the Lord feeds his people and blesses them in this beautiful, remarkable place. Some days, the doors can hardly close. It is the people stream into the temple. I am overwhelmingly grateful. I don't know what a person does after this kind of service ever again to approach that same kind of holy place. But I am truly grateful to be there myself. Of all the various projects and callings you've been involved in, which has been most fulfilling or rewarding? Well, of course, there's that question again, what's the best? Um, I think that all of my service has been exactly for the moment I was at and the place that I was at, spiritually and emotionally myself. And I, so I think I've been led along to help me be prepared for every place. At the moment when I am able to do something that is significant in someone else's life, that is the moment when I am the happiest. That is the moment when, when I see a need and I'm able to find, find a resource within myself or something. That's what makes me happiest. There are many people who do it better than I do, but it makes me happy to be able to make a difference anywhere. Are there any words of wisdom or scriptures that you've lived your life by? A different one every day. <laughs> um, I have come to understand that revelation is fresh. That it comes to you just as you need it. That it is personal, always. And that it is perishable. By that I mean you have to act upon it. So, and that is something relatively new for my understanding. But, so that's why I can't say that there's one thing because everything I've needed has been given me at the moment when I needed it and only at the moment when I needed it. Sometimes I've had to take huge steps of faith into an, a spot where I didn't know what to do next but then the revelation would come or the inspiration or what should I do for this child? What should I do for our home? What should I do in this capacity with young women? What should I do at the temple? Every time I was in the need, the fresh revelation came. Then, and it was for me personally, and I needed to act upon it. So it, it's fresh, it's personal, and it's perishable. If you ever have any free time, what do you like to do with that? <laughs> and I do long for those moments when I can kind of relax. I love stitching. I love making beautiful things with my hands, whether it be quilting or weaving or just anything that I can do in a creative process. I really love that. And I love listening to audible books while I'm doing it, because I can do two things at the same time. I can listen to the most gorgeous words or to a captivating story and stitch 
at the same time. So I love to do that. And I love, I love to be with my husband. We love to go. I think our mission experience was actually transformative in our marriage because we love to go on a long ride and listen to a fabulous book. And he's driving, so he's doing all the work. And I'm stitching, looking at the, looking at the beauties all around me and listening to a fabulous story. What would you like to be remembered for? Oh, wow. Um, I want to be remembered by my children and my grandchildren. And if nobody else remembers me, I'm okay with that. Um, when I was growing up, I did not have the influence of a grandmother because of situations, distance, and other situations in my life. And so I have been trying to figure out on my own what a grandmother would do for a child. And so when I go, I want to be remembered by my grandchildren as being the most incredible loving Grammy that the whole world has ever known. I, I want to squish them as much as I can. I want to tell them that they're really important people to me and to God. That's what I want to be remembered for. I want to be the best mother and Grammy that's ever happened. And I'm kind of silly about it. So, What has been a trial in your life? What have you had to overcome? Um, probably the depression that I suffered through after the birth of my 11th baby was huge because all of the world makes me happy. The sun coming up in the morning makes me happy. Um, hot chocolate on a winter day makes me happy. So when I found myself in a truly sad spot and I couldn't change it by something, you know, something I could bring into my life, that was really difficult for me. And I remember pleading with the Lord to, to take it away. But now I realize some of the most important lessons I have learned have come from that experience. Um, when I, when my soul hungered for light, for that, that was difficult for me and the experience of cancer. There, I, I thought I was compassionate, but I have never seen suffering like I saw suffering, not on my part, but on the part of other people who were going through that particular trial. And I think both of those were extremely difficult for me, but they also were so important to me. I will never be the same person because of either of those experiences. What advice do you have for women in Utah? First of all, I love being a woman. I, I would not have chosen, well, who knows where the choice was, I, but I, I wouldn't choose to be anything else. I think this remarkable role of the nurturer of all life. That's what I see women as. And I don't care that somebody else is building things or, you know, um, organizing in a different way. I see this, this remarkable uh, vision of women who are strong and good and whose whole life brings life and sustains goodness in the world, I think that's a pretty good place to be. And I would say to them, find that place. Find where you can move forward and do good, do make things better for everyone that you touch. And when you find that, you'll find great satisfaction I don't know that it comes in a boardroom. Maybe it can. 
I don't know a lot of things. I think it can probably be in any place where you are. But find the place where you can make the greatest difference in the lives of other people. And for me, for I, I believe that that place is in the home first and then every other place in the world. I believe that women really can have just about everything, but I don't think they can have it all at the same time. And I do believe that they have to prioritize their lives. And I do believe that the gift of life to another soul to bring it into this world requires a great sacrifice and all they have to give. So I, I love being a woman. I, I love what's available for women in this life right now. Wow. Wow. What opportunities. And I salute all of the amazing women who have made a change in so many lives. They are mothers. They are the mothers of all living. They are amazing women. Is there anything else you would like recorded about your life? Oh, I can't think of a single thing anybody else needs to know. I am grateful to be who I am. I'm grateful to be here. I think I'm here because God placed me here. I hope I'm able to do whatever he had in mind. I Every day I'm asking, is this what I should be doing? Help me be productive today. Help my life matter to other people. That's what I want to do. Can we have your birth date? Okay. Date and your marriage date. Okay, boy. Let's see if I can come up with both of those. Um, I was born December 13th, 1947. I think it was a Friday. I th we better check. People think Friday the 13th is not a good day, but I actually think it's a pretty good day. And I have loved that I was born so close to Christmas. At first, I thought it was the plague of my life. But now, I think it's a great thing. And I was married March 15th. 1968, which was the greatest day because I got to be with my husband. Where were you married? We were married in Salt Lake at the Salt Lake Temple, and it was fabulous. And and life is really, you know, people say, well, she's done extraordinary things. Actually, every day is really normal. I mean, if you talk to somebody and their life isn't in many ways really normal, I think that would be really bizarre. So, Where did you attend school? Okay. I uh, graduated from Murray High School. I was very active in student activities. I didn't like anything that had to do with math. I crossed, and I apologize to every woman who loves math, and I have many granddaughters who are doing very well, but I would actually go to the other end of the building in order to go upstairs so I didn't pass by the math areas. And I did exactly what I needed to, but I was so full of history and, and theater and all kinds of things like that. So, and I was on the yearbook staff and, and I had a great time. I just loved student life. And then I attended Brigham Young University on a debate scholarship, which I was extremely grateful for. I have often had people ask me, well, you ask me who is an influential person in my life. I have to say that my debate coach and my forensics coach, he was also our speech coach. Um, of all the people, of all the teachers, he was probably one of the most influential because he helped me learn to analyze an argument and to see its weak points and its strengths, to see two sides in every argument, and to be able to express myself in a way that um, I feel could be influential to other people. So I'm grateful to him. I called him one day, I'm sure he didn't even remember who I was, and just told him thank you, because I thought he had been um, with the amount of public speaking that I do what an influence he has been on my life. Do you mind giving us his name? Would that be appropriate? Well, I would be happy to, and I don't know how he's doing, but his name, uh, 
His name is Sam Moore. <clears throat> he was the debate and forensics coach at Murray High School. And I remember that he used to raise a sign at the back of the room because when I would get involved in an argument, the tone of my voice would raise and the pitch would raise until I was, he called it squeaking. So um, he was great and I, and I debated on the team there. I love that. My favorite thing was extemporaneously speaking, extemporaneous speaking. And uh, my husband will tell you that I have been extemporaneously speaking ever since. So the skills that he gave me were invaluable to me, and I'm grateful. So much of what you talk about, you just have this attitude of gratitude. Where did you learn the grateful heart? Where did, where did that first appear in you, do you think? I don't know. Where does the heart of gratitude come from? <clears throat> I I don't know where the answer to that is because how can you be living surrounded in the most beautiful world and not just think, oh my goodness, this is the gorgeous place to be. Um, like I said, growing up in the Cottonwood area, trees and moonlit nights and and streams and the mountains so close by and snow and rain. I, I just think it probably comes from the connection with nature. When you were a young mom with all of those little children, <coughs> and your husband would have been busy with Word Perfect and developing a business like, were you, how did you cope during those years? What was it like to be a young mother of many children with probably not a lot of support, or did you have a lot of extended family or neighbors and friends? How did you do it? Um, years ago, I went to speak at a BYU class about entrepreneurial efforts, and um, I talked to them about the Storytelling Festival. And one of the young men, and rightfully so, said, Mrs. Ashton, you couldn't have done anything with getting those sponsorships in the area if your husband hadn't been of such influence in the business community. And um, I remember I was taken back with a question because I felt like it was fairly aggressive. And I said, I believe you are right. I think the position my husband enjoyed in the, in the business field at that time made a difference and it opened the doors for me. But I said, you have to understand that the two of us were working together all the time and that he would not have had any family to come home to if I had not been there doing what I did and doing it very well. I have never felt weak. I feel strong and I have felt always that I could do the job that was handed to me. So when he began to work incredible hours, he would come home from his work at the university. I asked him if he would please, if he could please be home from 5.30 till 7.30 so that we could have dinner together and we could begin to prepare the children for bed. And then I would take over again and he would be up and gone by about 5 a.m. in the morning. I don't know how he did it physically. I don't know how I did it physically, but I felt capable of doing it. And I have always felt like he got a very good deal when he married me. I am not a, um, I like to think of, I'm not a racehorse. I'm not a beautiful um, racehorse. I'm a Clydesdale. But I'm not worried about being a Clydesdale. I'm a really good Clydesdale. And, and he needed a job done. We both needed a job done. And I knew I could do it. And he was, the two of us together hung in there together. I, that's what I think is the beauty in a, in a marriage between the two of us we could make it work. 
with your grandchildren today, with 59, did you say? Yes. 59 grandchildren. Do you see them? Do you have a certain day that everybody gathers? How do you manage spreading your love for them? How do you do that? People often ask me about how do I manage 59 grandchildren? And and I can't blame them because there are days when I wonder about it myself. But, but the truth is, um, love is never divided. It only multiplies. And I am really grateful to live really close to 10 of my 11 children. I only have one child that lives out of state, which is a grief to me. I've been trying to get her back for years, but her husband has a wonderful job in the state of Texas. But the rest of them live within 30 minutes. So once a month, we have a big family birthday party where we sing happy birthday to all of these people in a row, and we have dinner together, and we have a great time. And, and then I see them they come through the back door. They come for tennis lessons. And we we did a genius thing without knowing that it would be. Well, we put a swimming pool in the backyard, and it brings them home every summer. We put a tennis court up in the backyard. It brings them home every summer. It brings them here with their children to have classes and lessons. And I've done everything in my house to make it a really good Grammy trap. I took an old bedroom downstairs a couple of Christmases ago and said, I don't need this for a bedroom anymore. I mean, I'm making it into an art studio. And I filled it up with paper and pencils and glue sticks and pipe cleaners and tongue depressors. And it's down there. And they spend hours down there. And then I made another room something else for the girls. I took the bedroom, you know, to do that. So I, we've got a really good trap for grandchildren. And then when they come through the back door, I want to kiss them as much as I can. And this last week they were here and they were raking the leaves across the street until they hit huge piles. And and they were jumping into the piles of leaves. And I didn't know putting trees up that would drop leaves would be a good idea for grand, as a grandmother, but it's been great. So all the simplest things, a great sand pile, a slide in the backyard, a toy room in the upstairs, we've just said in every way said, you are so welcome here. We want you to come and we want you to stay. And then, while they're in the middle of that, we're trying to deliver all the messages that are the most important for us to deliver to them. So that's how I manage the grandma thing. I probably miss out. I don't mind saying that I probably have missed out on some, and I feel really bad about that, but I'm doing my best. What's a typical day for you um, right now? I know that makes with the temple responsibility, that's probably the yeah. core of what you A typical day for me would depend on what time I'm going up to the temple. I look at three golden hours. I either have them in the morning or I have them in the afternoon. If I am at the temple late in the day, then I have three golden hours at the beginning that I need to use to study, to prepare, I'm trying to learn how to play the harp. Don't ask me why that. I think I'm trying to get this old brain to do something new. Um, I, I, um, if the after, if the three hours come in the afternoon, I've got to use part of one to take a nap, and then I have the afternoon to walk through the yard. When I'm there early, early in the morning, which is 4:45 in the morning. When I'm there very early in the morning, I I take that little nap in the afternoon, and then I'm not really of much good to anybody the rest of the day. I'm pretty tired. So right now the the temple is what is 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 balancing that. Um, when we have a few days off from the temple, I try to I try to find a moment to myself. It doesn't always happen, but I really try, and. Um, 
that's what my life is kind of like. It's all, right now, it's all balanced on whether I'm going early to the temple or late to the temple. This evening, in a few moments, I will leave to go to the temple, and I will not return till close to nine, and then I'm tired, and I need to get ready and go to bed. So, th actually, this is my magic hour. You have it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we're so grateful for it. One last question. Is there anything? I can't believe you're taking the harp. Did you play the piano? Did you? I did play the piano as a young person. And I thought when I finished my service on the Young Women's General Board, I said to my husband, I think I'll learn to play the harp. Well, that was crazy. You know, I'm always trying to learn something new. One year I wanted to learn how to weave. And bless his heart, he bought me an eight harness loom. And I took up weaving, but then I was called to do something else and I put the, the loom away. And so I thought, I'm gonna have some time here because I've spent so much time on the Young Women's General Board. I'm gonna have some time here. So I'm gonna take up the harp. I had a week. I had a week in between being released from that and being called to be the matron and having to learn all of that. But in the meantime, my husband had bought me the harp. So now during that three hour golden hours that I have either here or there, I've got to figure out how to practice the harp. And, and I, my teacher is amazing. And the other day I said to her, because I've been doing this now for several years, and I'm still on an elementary level because I said, you are seeing a very old brain trying to do something very new. And it's really hard for me. It is really hard for me. So that's, I'm still in the middle of learning how to play a few Christmas songs in a way that might be helpful to somebody else. Someday I hope I can take the harp to somebody who's, who's having a difficult time and play for them. That day is not yet. I'm not anywhere even near that day, but we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Karen, you're spending a lot of time doing family history. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? I know that's been important to you. I, I, I have those three golden hours that I've talked about in the morning and in the evening. I'm telling you, I have found family history. They have made it so that even a person like me can actually do this. And I can do a little, I can do some every few days, and I found hundreds of people in my family. That's why I want to go back to Massachusetts. I found out my family was there for hundreds of years. They were there for the Revolutionary War. They're there um, shortly, I mean, they're there for the Civil War back in that area. They are so involved. I love that my family was there and I want to go back and I'm on the computer and I'm doing my family history and sometimes I'll say, oh, hello, Betsy. And my husband will say, what did you say? And I'll say, hello, Betsy. I found Betsy or I found something else and I have to stand up and do a dance because I found somebody new. And nobody knows that. I quietly do that on my own. And unless the church is tracking me or somebody's tracking me to see what I'm doing, nobody knows that I'm doing that. But it's very fulfilling for me. I love doing it. Amazing. Is there anything else you would like to do in the future? I mean, you've got these broad, and you, you quilt. I wanted to ask about your quilting. Do you, do you still find time to quilt? And how many quilts have you made? I mean, when okay. did you do that? <clears throat> because years ago, uh, well, my husband had some physical problems a little while ago, after just after we began our service in the temple. And I thought, uh, no, none of us knows how long we're going to get to be together. And I want to spend as much time with him as I can. Now, that means a lot of education in football, basketball, and a multiple of other sports things. He loves that, and I love him. So I spend moments of time when he is watching 
and I am by him. So that's when I stitch. I don't just go sit by myself normally. I'm sitting with him and I'm having a moment with him and I am stitching or I'm so yeah, I still get some quilting done. I'll I get quilting done and I get cross stitch done and I and people say, When did you find time to do this? And I think, Well, I did it on the way to the jazz game and I did it on the way back from the jazz game. And I did it watching BYU basketball. And I did it watching football playoffs. And so that's when I do it now. But I do it, actually I do it because I'm sitting right next to him. I, years ago, I went into the apartment of David O. McKay. My husband is David O. McKay's grandson. And I went up there and there were two little blue velveteen chairs. And he, when he had a moment, he would sit there and he loved to watch football because of course he was one of the very first football players at the University of Utah. So he would sit there and Emma Ray, his wife, would sit next to him. And those two chairs were symbolic to me of these two wonderful people who lived their life together. And then as their lives began to wind down, they found solace in sitting next to each other. And she probably watched more football than she ever wanted to. And he didn't have that much time to do it, but when he did, he enjoyed it and she wanted to be with him. So I've decided we don't have two little chairs. We have a sofa, but we're doing the same thing. So she crocheted, I knit, I cross stitch, I do something else anyway. So that's what I do. Is there anything you'd still like to do that you have not, you've had such a full life. Is there anything you'd like to do in the future you haven't had time for yet? Yeah. I want to go with my husband and I want to visit all the national parks because I think they're so beautiful. And I want to go back and see the historical sites. I love history. I love battlefields of all the crazy things. I love to see Civil War battlefields. I love the stories from war because I think they bring out, it's the beauty that they bring out that I think is inspiring the, what people did to help each other during difficult times. I want to go all over the country I've made a plan, that's that I'm not going to take all 83 of us with us, but I'm going to go in a little motor home with my husband, and we are only going to go a little at a time. We're not becoming nomads. We have responsibilities here, but if we go away for a while, we'll go ourselves and listen to a great, a great book on tape, then we'll stop at an airport and pick up one of our children and their spouses, and we will investigate that area and all of its exciting things and come to understand what happened in that area. Then we will say goodbye to that couple and they will fly home. Then we'll go down the road to the next place, have one of our children and their spouses fly in, like to Boston. Spend a week in Boston looking at the museum and all the historical sites, eating all the really good food in Boston. Then send them out on the plane in Boston. Go up to Maine, Portsmouth, Maine. Have one of the children fly into Maine and their spouse, because it's so fun to be with them. They're our favorite people. And go through Portsmouth, Maine and out to Arcadia. And that's my plan. That's what I'm going to do next. And I want to get to see all of those things. That's what I want to do. Great. Where do you come up with these ideas? They just come. <laughs> In your golden hours, maybe. They, during the golden hours, during the golden hours, I'm planning for something always ahead. And, and I have many friends who are willing to help me plan. And, and I think maybe get in a little bit of trouble. And I don't mean bad trouble, I just mean something new to do. And I have to find the right 
The larvae, I think I found it. It's one of those little Mercedes Benz vans with just a little toilet in it. I mean, it's just for two little old people. Go off someplace, see something beautiful, have all my children, have my children come. Actually, we have to have a couple come because my husband loves to play tennis and I don't play very well. So we need another couple at least to come so that we can find a tennis court and play t tennis together. And, and so we can play a healthy and vigorous game of Rummy Cub at the end of the day. <laughs> and then we can go to the temple along the way, visit all the temples. He promised me he would take me to all the temples. He made that promise before there was 175 of them, but <laughs> he still promised it. So I'm planning on it and that's what we're gonna go do. Gonna go visit all the national parks and all the temples. <laughs> okay. Can I just say thank you for the Thanksgiving food card? Oh, you're so welcome. It has been a glorious place for us, for our family. And the place where the idea of the Utah Women's Walk really came to, to be formed. And so your desires to bless the lives of others have been remarkably fulfilled in my life. So thank you. I'm thank grateful. You. Thank you for telling me. I. When people come up and say, oh, we had so much fun with our grandchildren out at the Museum of Natural Curiosity, I think they couldn't say a nicer thing to me because that's why it's there. You know, thanks for helping my family have a great time. Here, here's something for your family to have a great time. Anyway, it's been a wonderful life. Yeah, you <sighs> created a beautiful, wonderful life that's blessed a lot of people. We thank you for that. I'm I think you're back. You're our kind of last. It's only right and proper that you're our final of the hundred interviews. Oh, there you go. So, <laughs> it will continue. There'll be more, but it's only right that it's you. So thank you. Well, I'm excited that you're going to talk to Ellen Clyde and see what they're doing and kind of because I think they're um, they're hoping to archive in their library a lot of things and anyway. We'll, it's we'll a wonderful do life. Definitely do that. Thank you, Karen. You're, You're so, so welcome. Thank you so much. So much. Alrighty. Okay.